Now, I did so Huey, and a Canadian, kind of the same thing, and mm-hmm. kind of. Yeah, yeah because so. the Canadians have web feet. Don't they? Yeah. Uh, absolute pleasure for us. Nice Colin, to meet pleasure you. Pleasure to yeah, meet yeah. you. Ben, weasel your way onto the podcast again. Hmm. So, 25 years ago, when I was reading a certain book by a person called Chris Ryan, did not expect I'd be sitting here. 25 years later, talking to the man. <laughs> um, and then to find out, you only, you've done a, not done a podcast yet. Yeah. First podcast. It's the technology. <laughs> technology. <laughs> but you guys, see, so, so people are, I know Ben, you guys have got a similar background in, in Tutu. Um, pick off the conversation from where we were talking before we started. You're on about the, the there was no social media back in the day. No, I mean, situation. the internet didn't even exist when I was in, you know, in, in the regiment. Um, I can see the benefits, obviously, it gives you, but also the negativity and, uh, from that side. So it's a balance. Um, the fact that, you know, just simple things that you can look on Google, you know, Google Maps, for, for instance. Uh, if you go back to the, the first Gulf War, the, map, the mapping that we had dated back to 1945. That's when it was printed. And then they give us a modern one, but it was an aviator's map. So it was a quarter of a million. It was absolutely unfit for purpose. Um, GPSs, GPSs came in a box like that. And um, they weren't that accurate and they were very difficult to use. So I can see the benefits of technology. That was the Magellan, a big yeah, piece yeah, yeah. from Magellan. Yeah, yeah. I remember, yeah, the, the, the aviation maps. I mean, when I went to Afghanistan the 6, we got, no, it was Iraq. Went to Iraq in 2003. And we got given that, so they were one in one million aviation maps. What well, you know, they dish them out anyway. They give them out anyway. Oh, yeah, <laughs> our, our escape maps, they were, they were, you know, they covered the whole of Iraq. Um, I suppose they were the only decent things. And I was lucky that I just had to follow the course of a river. I'd have been screwed if it had been in the jungle or a different, you know, theatre of operations. Um, I, I wouldn't have gotten out. So all I had to do is get a balance of where the river was, and that's where you get all your, ha- you know, your habitation, the locals. But then the wadis ran down towards the river. Now, if I pulled away so I was more in the interior, and then I was walking up and down, um, and there was no way I was going to cover 190-odd miles by doing that. So I, I tried to stay on the plains and just stay far enough away from from the locals. But if I'd had you know, a GPS or had a decent map, you could have picked your way through, and it would have been a lot easier. Yeah. Do you think that, um, we can come back onto that, but maybe 190 miles, I forgot how far it was. Do you think you guys think that with the advancement of information technology, especially with social media is concerned, do you think that it impacts the quality of the recruit, generally speaking, for the British forces? Oh, we, we talked about this a few times. I think, um, <clears throat> so um, we played in the woods as kids. That's what we, we, we talked about. We, we, we played in the woods as the kids. We, Field craft was something very natural to a lot of us because we did that all the time. I haven't seen, I think the standards of field craft have to be a lot more worked on. They've been worked on by the depot screws and their instructors more so than they would have done probably, certainly in my time when I first joined and certainly your time. In, um, when it comes to technology, however, we're seeing uh, the recruits now and also the students now, they're all over it. I mean, straight away, you can give them the kit. But the problem you've got then is how to implement the technology or what happens when that te- technology goes down. How do you still... So, for example, it's great uh, to have a GPS and to have all these other bits and pieces. What happens if your GPS goes down? Do you have the knowledge of knowing what the rivers do? Do you have the knowledge of uh, how to hide, how to evade, the reason why things are seen, etc., etc.? So I think the seeing... Or what I have seen is people all over technology, but not necessarily over the basic skills. We were just talking about that as well. <clears throat> in my experience, going back into the, into the well, it was late 70s, I was getting ready to join as a boy soldier. I got jaundice, so I was put back, um, missed that intake. In that in-between time, I joined the TA SES 23 SES. And there, their focus was a lot of escape and evasion, living out in the woods, under a basher, uh, navigational skills. We used to do them stay behind shelters on the on the German border. Now that's just that's a basic skill. That's your foundations. Um, I had the feeling when I joined twenty two in in the mid eighties, um, we were above it. We wouldn't. Nobody was interested in doing an escape and evasion exercise because it meant you only had dirty, wet, and 
you know, it was going to be difficult. But that is the foundations of any soldier, whether it be an ordinary infantier or a special forces soldier. He needs to know that. Everything that Ben has just said there, that, that is, that's a must. It's you, pretty basic, yeah, right? Yeah, you, you can't skip on it. And then from that side, I think, again, a lot of young kids coming in maybe now need to be taught that and, and shown that. But I, 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 there's, there's a, a second sense, I think, you, you look at where you will see something and you'll know that's danger. You, before you've even worked out, you know, where's your escape route, you, you move into a position and you go, right, I'm blocked in here. If I get taken this side, I've got nowhere to run or whatever. You know, all the basic stuff. And it's very important, I think, that soldiers understand that. You get that when you go into like a pub. Yeah. You know, straight you, you away, hairs go on the bank thing. Uh, I've got a bad vibe of this place. This feel right. I need to do this. So I need to raise this to everyone else to kind of get, to get that. So, totally. You, there's just something there. You know, when a guy gives you a look. You, you can pick out regiment guys, you can pick out military guys just by simple things. And you, you're making these assessments as you're ordering that pint of lager as well. And you will see where if somebody's got an interest in you when you're walking down a street. I mean, because of the work I've done since leading a regiment and being in the, say, the, the public domain, I still walk down the street and I'm looking, the guy's looking at me, I'm thinking, what the fuck are you looking at? And I made a big mistake one time, and this is going back probably 15 years. I was in a bar in Newcastle, and this guy's standing staring at me. So I thought, fuck, I'm not going to wait till it kicks off. So I went across. I said, you know, what's wrong? What's your problem? I went, oh, I just thought you were Chris Ryan. And I felt <laughs> such hate. Just, I was like, oh, for Christ's sake. You know, it, it was just one of them things. You have to live up the reputation there, you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I was, but I was just... <laughs> No, I was more embarrassed. But uh, anyway, but no, that's getting on to the basics. Because I'll tell you one thing, and, and you, you both know this. One thing with technology, it always fails. And it always fails when you, you need it. It's like, it's like that stoppage on a, on, a, on a weapon. It's like when you can't get through on the radio or, or the internet crashes. And again, going back to basic skills, getting that compass out. Now, when, in 1991, when, when we were on the ground there, um, we'd been given the wrong frequencies for um, the 320, which had the EMU, the burst system, and uh, we couldn't get through. And it came down to me on Morse code. Basics. You know, if you don't have them skills, you can't do it. And that was, I remember doing an exercise with Delta. We went over to Oman. This is in the um, mid-80s. And uh, they had radio, handheld radios. And we were getting out the, the 320 and tapping away after, you know, getting the, the code book out, the encryption out, running through all of that. And he was laughing and joking at us. And I thought, you know, it must be fantastic just to be able to get a, you know, like a, an encrypted uh, radio and be able to talk. But then we went to the jungle where his kit didn't work and he couldn't communicate. And that's basics. There's also something that you've got at the moment is the reliance on technology. So um, we've seen this a lot recently. In When uh, I joined 20 plus years ago, when you joined, um, we worked on skets. We only communicated when we needed to communicate. We communicated on times and, and that we were told to need to. What we're seeing now is an over, um, uh, over need, um, a requirement for information. We're seeing a lot of the, the officers where they need this information. Uh, and the reason why that happens is because we're seeing oh, we're overly risk adverse culturally because that's the way we become, and because we're overly risk adverse, we need that information to give us the warm fuzzy. Also, what we find is officers just can't be content with what information they have, so they need to put little pictures on the wall. But all they're doing is is um, compromising the memory. The analogy I, I gave Jim Gore is the dick pic. Mm. A dick pic is a pointless piece of information that only ever gets you into trouble. So why send a dick pic? You know, and all that a dick pic is in modern technology is constantly sending me a sit rep of what you're up to. You don't need to do that. Yeah. The more I tra uh, transmit, the more the enemy are going to see me and the more I'm going to get compromised. Mm. So just stick to the basics. Yeah. The basics work. That's why we did it. You know? Well, that's a big piece of basic thing. Like even you know, going back in the day, whenever you were doing a job, the, the coming across the old radio waves was what's happening. Give me a feel. And it's like, Keep the airwaves clear. They had a problem with this in the Embassy when the B Squadron did the Embassy down in, was it 19, 80, 82, 81 or whatever? Um, yeah, they, a lot of the officers outside were told, just keep quiet, we'll tell you when we've got something to say. 
because it chucks everything up and nobody can get through. Nobody knows what what's going on. 1980, 40th anniversary. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <clears throat> um, no, absolutely. So, two th- I mean, I remember when I joined up. I joined up after you, and when I joined up, um, I went, went to three para, and it was we were getting ready to go. I think we were in Northern Ireland or something. And I had to put you all back together. Between sides, you had to put you all back together. And that consisted of hands around an A4 sheet of paper with some lines on it, and you filled your own details in. Right? Fast forward when I became a platoon sergeant, 2008. Jesus Christ. Mm. Office, computer, mm. my entire day was spent behind a computer. Because yeah. it was no longer just an all back. Exactly what you're saying. All this other stuff. All this other stuff. And some of it's necessary, some of it's not. But, I, you know, I, it took an effort to take myself away from that, spend time with the blokes, get out in the fitness in the morning, because other people just couldn't do it. Well, seven seven. my brother, he's still in Power Edge. He's commissioned now. And he's, he's he, he spoke about the, the health and safety aspect of it. And it was a paper chase. Now, a lot of soldiers, when they join the army, they're not really equipped to, to be, you know, doing a lot of paperwork. It's a cer- certain types of guys, you know, are suited to it. And a lot of it is a waste of bloody time when, when you consider what we're asking, you know, young paratroopers or young, young blades to do. You don't need them out writing reams and reams of shit. Um, it's, but I think that's society. When I've been on film sets doing different, different things, the health and safety, it's like a phone directory. And we don't have that anymore, do we? But it's a big book, just crap. So what happens if you trip over that set? What are you going to do? It becomes a hindrance on training. There is obviously, there's an absolute need for a lot of it. I, I can be right, but health and safety has to be there to ensure that it's um, being, it's supporting the training rather than being a hindrance <coughs> to the training. There is a certain amount of risk taken in our in our professions. Um, so we need that extra door, um, kind of bit of rope. But to be fair, the more and more constraints we put on ourselves, the harder it is to actually, when we want to go out the door in the end, it's hard enough to get those operations signed off hmm. because we because we're overly risk averse. Yeah, and I, 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 especially where I think where um, Hereford and Pool SF concerned in general. One of the problems you've got with that you've got the health and safety risk adversity on the website, plus very well known unit, a lot of public interest in it. So as as that, I'm really interested in your thoughts on this. I don't have any spent time in the training week, but I remember when. Remember when someone or a couple of people on selection died? It was a few years ago. Obviously, it's happened regularly. Not regularly. It has happened in the past. I remember a few years ago, hit the news, one or two people died on selection, and it went bigger than better. And it probably, that happens a fraction of the time. You know, risk is managed, but at the end of the day, so of course, things are going to go pear shit. Because of the public interest in the unit, it was, it, the, the reaction to it was, it was what's the, what's the word? It was a complete overreaction, yeah. complete knee jerk knee- knee- reaction, which sure, no doubt have the train that impacts the quality of the troop that you get in the unit. Yeah. Uh, just, I'll finish on that piece of just from my side, but before I left, there was a whole body set up to look after this, and they do a brilliant job, and they're all from the same backgrounds. So the people who actually dig out blind, they know exactly what we're training, how we're training, so they know exactly what they need to achieve. So the hats off to those guys for being able to do that. And what they do is make sure it's relevant to how we sort of conduct yeah. ourselves. The problem is, is everyone else trying to put their pennies worth in. And sure. you know, the more we've opened ourselves up, quite rightly, as you said, the more we open ourselves up, there's more people trying to get involved with it. Mm. No, I mean, it's, there is a, a thing, I, I guess, for, in terms of health and safety, but I would, I would imagine it's more pride for an operation, making sure the orders are given correctly. And that is a, there's a proper ledger of orders of actions on. So... In my case, there was back at back at the base. It was rumor control. Oh, they're going to head to Turkey. Oh, they're going to head to Syria. But through Syria, nobody had a clue where we were going. So your estimate that you put, and there was plan. no estimate. There was no uh, like uh, formal orders or anything. It was basically verbal um, on the back of a fag packet. Uh, mm-hmm. we're, we're going in. We're walking up. We're putting the OP in. We've got a, a forty-eight hour uh, lost comms procedure. Which we can go on to because that was really important, um, and that was it. Uh, so the lost comms. So forty-eight hours. Yeah. If there was no comms for forty-eight hours, yeah. then there'd be a action on. Yes, we would then. Um, it's a long old time. Oh, it is. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, um, yeah especially if somebody's chasing you. I'll tell you. But uh, no, we. Um, what was important? We had this lost comms procedure, and um, 
we were told that the, the, the heli would come into an RV, they would either give us a new radio um, or pick us up and relocate us or bring us back, which was fine in principle. The problem was when we left camp, when we were on the ground, they changed the policy. They said uh, 48 Moscons, forget about it, we're not going in to get them. Now, I, if they'd said to me when I was standing at the back of that Chinook, you're going in, but there's going to be no recovery if it goes wrong. I'd still get on the helicopter because that's what you're in the regiment or the army for. You're going, to, you're going in there to do a job. And yes, our risk would be very high, but you're in the SES, for God's sake. You know, so we would have all gotten in that helicopter. The trouble was, when we were contacted, we were making to an RV thinking there was a helicopter coming in at 20 hundred hours. Now, if the Iraq, Iraqis are getting in front of us in that RV, we would have fought through, undoubtedly lost guys to get there, to be sitting there, waiting, 20, 20 hundred hours comes in, and there's no bird. That was the problem. So they changed it and didn't tell you? Yeah. Right. I mean, there was nearly a mutiny back with their B squadron, you know, when they knew things had gone wrong. Um, and they said, we can't, we can't, we can't send a, you know, a helicopter in there. They did say that the message I sent was corrupt. It wasn't because I've spoken to the signaler. Uh, it was a young signaler in Cyprus uh, that I was basically, it was, it was open. It was on the guard net. As I said, we're compromised. We need, we need to pick up now. And he came back understood. Um, going back to that thing of, of the RV, it's knowing that there's an RV or safety's there and that directs you where, as it was, the Iraqis weren't between us and that RV. We made to the RV, but we got there, I think, five minutes before and we couldn't hear that boom, boom, boom. So we knew it wasn't coming because, you know, on general, generally the RAF are on time um, from there. So then that dictated that we had to, to um, keep moving on foot because the Iraqis were still um, following us up. It's, it's decisions like that that can cost lives and it's unnecessary, you know. What was the, so, the aftermath of the, of the operation then? Well, see, this is a big thing. Uh, when we got back, every every op or anything I did in the regiment, there was a debriefing. You would get into the old interest room, squadron interest room, and you would poke fingers, at, you know, how, what went wrong, how it went well, and it cleared the air. We got back, and uh, there was no debriefing. And... It was very unhealthy because then you've got like, well, originally it was eight guys, three got killed, you've got five guys that, you know, haven't, haven't let steam off. And it, it Why wasn't there a it, Well, they, they wanted to, like, it wanted to be covered up. The third, Ben will attest to this. I don't know. Have you ever heard of guys coming back from an operation and then being given money to go on holiday? Huh? Yes, we got back. <laughs> I was getting ready to go to Everest, to climb Everest. So, but I was barking at this point. Um, I was seeing things, hearing voices, and uh, I got in. And uh, OC came in and said, uh, "I think it was a thousand pound. Book yourself a holiday." I thought, I'll keep the thousand pounds, but I'm going to. I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to Everest. He went, "No, you're not." And uh, I ended up going to Tenerife. Sat with my missus with a fit, like a slap, you know, a face like a slapped ass. And like that for a fortnight. The other guys went off, and then we came back, and it was as if um, nothing had happened. As in, right, get on with your uh, work, guys. So you had this thing covering it. People were covering their asses. That's right from the top to the bottom, and it's not good. And you know, things went on, and I can remember it was the that year's uh, cross brief. Um, we we were all told that we would. Um, talk about what happened, you know, the experience of being captured or the escape and, you know, how we could change it. Well, not naming names, but the ops officer, um, he was in charge of, um, like, say, claymores and pistols that all went missing. Two or three grenades went missing. So I, I put my paper, I had to submit my brief to the regiment and it was just, like, scrubbed out. So keep it to about five to ten minutes. And I went, what, my escape? And he went, yeah. I was like, are you kidding me? I can do it. Five minutes is like, you know, is not long enough. And there's an interest there. The guys want to know what it was like. 
A and D squadron, when they found out that I was like on, well, we were on the run, they were like, these guys are going to die. They were in double sleeping bags. The, the diesel was freezing up in the Land Rovers, everything. So they wanted to know what the procedures were. And the head check were like that, no, five minutes. We can talk for five minutes. See, because from right from the top to the bottom, there was mistakes made. And the, the other bad thing as well was medals being handed out. Now, I've got this theory on medals. You know, they shine bright in, in sunlight, but they cast really long shadows. And it's, it just complicates things. And there was a few people, officers weren't getting them. Some were getting them. So they just wanted this shit show to go away. And it, it, it didn't do... I know some of the guys in the regiment suffered... Some of the guys in the patrol suffered mentally through that because there wasn't like a, you know, a clearing of, um, of voicing or, or, you know, even, even as petty as blaming somebody. And then it clears the air and you can get on because you've had your say. It's essential. It's really that one that you said absolutely. The, the the mental aspect of it. I had a conversation recently. I can't remember which podcast it was or something. I mean, who the fuck was that? I can't remember what it was. But we were, they were talking about that. You come in off a off an operation, off a mission, and the benefits to that after action review debrief. One yes, you you learn your lessons. You have a go at your muck at you fucked up, and you clear that air. You learn how you fucked up, how to improve on it. And you move forward. And the other aspect is, okay, that's that is drawing a line under that one, mm. and let's move on. Yeah. And and for a mental asthma aspect, it's absolutely fucking critical. There's also recognition as well. I think I think it's important the units recognition what those individuals gone through. Yeah. Um, I think it's too easy just to say right here you got five minutes on a cross brief, or you you're not even on the cross brief, you know, and and which has happened to some lads. You know, and uh, but what those lads, although they get the recognition of their own friends and their own guys in the patrol, what they're not doing is getting the official recognition from the unit as a whole that what's actually happened. And I think that is a massive thing to clear the air. Mm. And that's what people actually need there. It was a funny. This is this is. It was quite funny when I think about it. It wasn't funny at the time. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the the lads that were left from that patrol were all called up to the CEO's office. And I got there first, and the boss, um, he said, right, he said, in five minutes, you're going into a room through there. He said, there's a doctor, a psychologist doc, and a psychiatrist. He said, they want to make, a, like, a, they want a set up here. He said, you go in there, and you tell them you're fine. I don't care if you're not, you just tell them you're fine. So I went, yeah, 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 yeah. So I went in, sat down with them, and I've got this diagram on the, uh, on the wall, and it's a, it's a jug with uh, water in for a normal person half filled. Uh, for somebody who's stressed, it's it's full. So I'm sad. And he goes, um, do you have any nightmares? I went, no. Nope. First lie. Uh, are you seeing any images? No. Nope. Second lie. Uh, everything all right at home? Absolutely. Fourth lie. And so on. And then he said, uh, right. He said, what do you want to do? I went, I want to go for a run because I'm on my lunch break. And he went, uh, okay. But I mean, I was barking and so was all the other lads. But there wasn't even a... I think really what they should have done, like a sergeant major or, or a senior, a senior member of the regiment, balanced, you know, somebody switched on, should, should have sat us down and said, fellas, what's going on? Because I went up to, um, I got posted to forward project, projection and I was sat there with a lad from D Squadron and he'd been, in, he was the last guy out of the helicopter when, in the Falklands. And he said, Jody, do you, um, do you have any nightmares? I'm like, no. So, there are any problems or anything like that? I was like, no, nah, nah. like, no, no thing. I said, why do you? He went, actually, he said, um, I was the last guy out of the helicopter. Um, his legs were trapped under a guy, uh, guy's legs, and this lad pulled his legs out and pushed him, tapped him on, and this lad knew that a guy had died. He said, I cannot sleep in a room with the door closed. And uh, he said, you know, if if I, if I go to bed, sleep, and the missus comes to bed and she closes the door, I said, I wake up gasping from it. And he said, it's a real problem when I go to hotels. I can't can't leave a hotel door open. And he said, I have, I have real problems. I was like, well, I said, to tell you the truth, mate, I said, uh, I can't sleep in a room without the door being closed. And it was the opposite effect of his, and it was. I mean, I... I in my house, I had uh, locks on the bedroom doors. If I went to a hotel, I was dragging like drawers across, you know, the door. And it's just when I look back now, sim- 
one of my hardest field interrogations was through uh, uh, three parrot, and it was up in Otterburn. And again, I'd be about 18 years old, and uh, you had to get captured. Now, just off the ranges, there's a, there's a river that runs through one of the valleys called Blind Burn, and there's a section where it is um, about 12 foot deep. And being up north in the, on the borders, it's always freezing cold. Well, these buckets got me and they uh, stripped me down, tied ropes around my wrist and put me into the water until I was numb. And then they had a couple of airborne shelters with, uh, you know, the uh, gas um, heaters in there. And they'd just bring you in. And the pain, you know, as it comes through your fingers, I mean, you just sat watching me and you doubled up. And then if you didn't say, you know, anything other than, you know, the magic for you were back in that water, which then took your breath away and you're there then giving it this. Couldn't get away with it. I don't suppose you could get away with that shit now. I had, I had two parrots, my hunter force, and because um, I was ex two parrots, as the older guys would come around, they were all screwed. They're not trying to, you know, like put, put food in my mouth. Got to a stage where I couldn't take on any more food, <laughs> and I'm getting, I'm getting gobbed off at by the new crows who didn't know me. The older geezers are trying to square me away, and I'm going into these interviews, about to get smashed in these interviews, trying to swallow as much food as. I can. <laughs> Mega. But then, obviously, the whole time, I just got accused of cheating or, or, or staying in hotels. Or, yeah. You can't win. No, you no, can't no, win. no, no, no. Like, well, like, we, we used to, when I was on training wing as an instructor, we'd say to the guys, you know, cheating's not a crime. It's getting caught. Yeah. And if you get caught, you're in the shit. So just don't get caught. Because, I mean, I, I was with a, me and a, a, lad, a lad from Tupac, and we had, like, three guys just doing combat survival with us. And um, I remember, just before we were getting released, we got the old five pound note into a Johnny, and I was, I don't want to, I don't want to swallow that. And we, we create, uh, got one of the guys, um, or just that doing the course to swallow it. And when it eventually came out, we, um, went to this farm, knocked on the old door. Mom was right, mom's there, and like, is there, is there, is there any shops? And she said, I know exactly who you are. Get into the barn. My husband will be back shortly. She came in with tea and sandwiches. He comes back, comes in the barn, he said, what do you want, husband? You want to go to a shop. So you went two minutes, I'll get the car. He comes out, he's got a shotgun, which he's loaded. <laughs> we get in the back, gets into a village, go in, buy a load of Mars bars and everything else, take them out. And uh, he's standing in the, in the street <laughs> waiting. And I'm thinking, if that under force comes down here, you let a couple of. But what, what if he found you with a Johnny in your hand with five pounds <laughs> in front of his missus? <laughs> I mean, how would that look? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, everybody did it. It was it was funny because uh, again, with, um, again, being switched on, we were caught in this copse, and the dog teams came up and they had this freaking rock pile. It looked like a Shetland pony, and um, me and Dick, sorry, he swear, but he cracked on. Yeah, we're sitting there and we said to these lads, right, uh, obviously we're off better than you guys. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to break. That way, distract the dog team. The dog will come after us. You run that way. So push yourselves right to the edge. And when we give you the thumbs up, you run. So we'll let that. They go, get on the edge, go. They start running. Like, stick them like that. Stay still. Good bloke. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> jacked on his <isn't> <laughs> I can remember seeing this thing bounding across and the scream from one of the guys that just pulled him down. Then me and, me and my mate just, uh, we leg it. Um, it was good times, uh, messing. I got accused of, uh, I got, when was it? That was it. The interrogator was this quite an attractive, uh, woman. And, um, she was, she was, she was going at me, proper beast in me. And she was saying, why have you got this weapon system? And it's weird. Obviously, we use it, like, rubber weapons at the time. Why have you got this weapon? So, well, actually, it's this weapon, and such and such. And, uh, why were you holding these radios? Why did you have all this kit on you? And, and I said, listen, I just got let down. I got let down by my unit. I got let down by my, by my subunit. I got let down by my company. I've just been let down. There's no one ever let you down. And I went on like this. I, was, I had these like puppy dog eyes. And she looked at me. And then she went round the back. Came back round and slapped me in the face. She said, you little bastard. You nearly had me then. Just for a moment. <laughs> but but then it's classic. Because yeah. my chat lines have been so shit that I've never been able to keep the pattern going for long enough anyway. So yeah. it's kind of run out of things. Yeah, I'll tell you what, the, yeah, the female interrogators were always good. They would um, catch people out. On my on my selection, um, six guys were all caught out by the female interrogator. Uh, all she was doing is you knew exactly when you went in there, 
uh, you're going to get stripped down. Your dick's going to be about this big because it's freezing cold. And she's going to pull up, you know, me out of it. She did it. And I mean, some of these lads have all been down south. They were big, big guys, launched themselves over the desk to try and throttle her. And that was like, you know, nearly four months of hard training. Really? Gone. Yeah, straight off. Losing the plot? Yeah. Going for it? Yeah, yeah, totally. Flipping that. And it was on, you know, president that you, you, you had it. And when I was on training ring, whenever we lost a, a student, it would be through a female interrogator pulling the mick out the size of your dick, and you're like, ah. Oh. Well, I've had that all my life, so that's kind of useful. Interesting topic there, because the female female dynamic is a fascinating one mm. and a flipping unknown quantity, definitely, broadly speaking, in the terms of battlefield stuff. We've obviously recently had um, first female to pass uh, all arms. Power, yes, see, yeah, uh, I read all that. P Company. Yeah. Rosie, what, Captain Rosie Wild, congratulations. Um, and and uh, my, my, my daughter, actually, my youngest, said to me a couple of months back, why don't they allow women, why don't they allow women to be, to go to war? I said, well, they do. No, they don't. No, they don't. Yeah, they do. No, they don't, Daddy. Trust me, they do. I serve with them on the front line. You know, medics, yeah. dog handlers. <laughs> We brought a clerk, I remember in 2006 when I first had a high four Afghan talk kicked off. We brought a clerk on the ground who was this high, you know, probably weighed four stone, piss wet through, took on the ground. She said, Yeah, I got the ground. She got the ground for the crack. Talk about health and safety nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> on the ground, yeah. right? And, uh, but females in infantry units, what do we think about that? It's very- An issue? Well, well, she's yeah. not going to be an infantry unit, is she? That's not. She's not going to be a paratrooper. That's Who? not what uh, Rosie, the girl, is just. No, no, no. So, but the, so it, she's it's not going to But you know, there is a, an, an administration issue, isn't there? You know, potentially uh, it depends on how culturally how open we are with having communal showers, toilets, and everything else like that. It depends. The problem often is the fact that we overcomplicate the situation by now going, well, oh, we'll need extra toilets, we'll need extra showers, we'll need extra this bits and pieces. Well, you know, if there's a role for, I mean, certainly on jobs that I know I've been on where I've had um, being on searches, they've been on everything we've done. They've been on the, they've been right at the front there with us and done everything we need to do. Uh, uh, We've never had a problem. We've never had a problem with the administration side of that. We didn't make it a problem. We, there was a requirement for these people to be on the ground. I think it comes down to is there a requirement or are we forcing the issue just to make sure that we've got a woman who's there? I think, yeah, that's the danger. If you get, say, a defence minister or somebody who wants to see the first woman in the SES and they, they change the standards of selection, that's dangerous because you're not doing the, the, the system any good and you're actually not doing her any good because she'd never be able to live with it because the, the, the guys would see if, the, if you're changing. And, and we've all seen in the past where you get, you know, an MP sticking his nose into the military and, and tweaking a process that shouldn't be, you know, changed. I, I would say that is a danger. I agree. Um, I, I sort of changed my opinion over the last few years. I'm of the, like, I think, I think it's going to go that way anyway. I think it's absolutely fine to end up. I mean, the administration side of things, the, the UK sort of camp life side of things aside, and the, the cost that's going to be incurred to accommodate females if you're talking about integrating them into what are currently all male units, because you, you, you're going to go from all male or into toilets, just toilets, for example, to now it's unisex. Well, just implementing those like building changes are going to cost a bomb, right? But that aside. I think if standards stay the same, because the standards are set, the standards are set because that's what battle dictates, that's what war dictates, that's what missions dictate, operational environment dictates, right? Well, you're absolutely right. If they start lowering those to accommodate females because you want to meet a fucking quota, then it's bullshit. But let's say that they don't, let's say that they don't change the uh, standards you need to meet to be able to go into the paras, go into the guards, go into the, whoever the rifles, whoever. Having a woman as part of, uh, well, let's say you've got a woman in the SAS as part of your patrol. Or back when we were three power as part of the section of the two. Oh, two power of yourself, sorry. See that as an issue? See any, can you imagine? It's, 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 it's an issue on the ground? You know, 
I honestly think is what is the requirement for that person to be there? What are they doing? What are they bringing to the party that uh, another male isn't? Are they bringing? Have they met the standard, and can they carry the kit and ensure they can do everything yeah. they need to do? If they can do, then fair play. But if they can't, we just put them there purely politically, or to get a Rupert another, um, you know, uh, uh, another promotion. Then that's just ridiculous. That's obviously going to be a hindrance and, and uh, uh, an issue on the people are seeing. And also, it depends on the theatre where you're operating, because it, again, there is certain areas and, and, and different roles where you want females. Absolutely next to you but they don't have to be badged they just need to be you know in my day it was the debt to be in that unit and whatever um but no it's in the 80s there was a, a co decided we were under strength and he just he he made a decision that anybody past the hills phase would automatically pass the jungle there was no no failures in the jungle Jesus. now Again, this is where you get interference from above. I believe the most important part of SES selection is the jungle. Absolutely. Because you've got the guys, they've shown they've got the fitness, that's it. It's now, can they carry a weapon? Can they think, you know, on their feet? Can they see things? All the basic shit. What we always is your health and safety to get to the trees. It's to show you fit enough to work in the yeah. trees. And on this particular um, selection, it was around about 87. Um, it was that laxed. The, stu the students were actually putting OPs on the DS and they knew that as long as they stuck with it, they would get in. What happened, about a year after them guys passing, it was a large pass rate. Probably about 10 or 12 of them were RTU'd. Sadly, some of them were killed because they shouldn't have been there in the first place because somebody tried to change selection. And as I said, the jungle is where you see into the soul of of your you know your your um, students. You understand. You you know him better because you're watching him. You know every single day. And this this CEO didn't get it. He didn't understand it. He just thought the hill space was. But surely he would have done the jungle phase himself. Though. Yeah, yeah. He um he I think he had freaking issues. This guy. He was the one that brought in their uh, cross pollination where. You were you, a squadron. He, there, there was a reason why he did it. Going back to the seventies, he was um, a young, a young troop, troop officer, and he got bullied by a group within B Squadron. And these were all major characters, and it was like a mafia. And the squadrons all had mafias, so nobody ever thought that he would come back as a you know a squadron commander, and never as the CEO. So when he came back as the CEO, he brought in the policy then of, of cross-pollination of senior NCOs, and it was to break up the mafias within it. Now, it didn't work, because what would happen is, and in particular, G-Squadron were very clever at it. If G-Squadron had guys they didn't want, they would say, oh, okay, uh, we'll send them over to B-Squadron, we'll send them to A-Squadron and get rid of them, but their, their senior NCOs were always like G-Squadron. Everybody else was playing the, you know, the, the game where you then go across to be troop staff sergeant in you know, the D squadron. And it was, it was never a good policy really because when you have a tight group, all of a sudden, you know, you're maybe waiting to become troop staff sergeant and then somebody from A squadron goes over and, and takes it. You think, I don't know you, you know, and my next like stop is this. Some of my best TLs though, they came from other squadrons. Mm. They think, I don't know why they didn't go. They didn't get a job in that squadron when they came to my squadron, even though they were, they, you know, they're outside. The yeah. They were amazing. Mm. I mean, I no, no, it worked. I mean, it worked because so we, we had a, some great uh, st staff. He's come from, well, in particular, air squadron. But that, what it was, was his issue there was breaking the mafias down. He was the guy who got, he got the whole regiment into the, um, the briefing room. And this is where he told, told us that they were going to badge, um, the senior NCOs from the debt. And it kicked off, and he said, I'm, I'm here to listen to your reactions. Well, all I was a young, a young probably corporal, all the senior NCOs stood up and said, No way, not a chance. Because again, they were looking maybe 10 years down the line at postings. So you've got somebody who's badged now that hasn't been through the system, and he could be taking your posting. Anyway, this whole thing kicked off. It was quite interesting. And at the end, he stood up and just said, It's happening anyway. I don't care what you want. 
these were his ideas, and he was the one, like I say, brought in this policy of, to get extra numbers into the regiment. You, if, you, if you survive the jungle, you're in, which is ridiculous. When, uh, they just don't work. And no, that's going back to lowering standards, say, to get a female, office, a, a female soldier in. It's, what's the point? No, exactly. There's, there's interesting things about having a female on the ground for many many reasons. Whether they've got a skill set that they bring to the ground, um, whether they are very capable of doing the job, or whether they actually bring just a different dynamic to the environment. A woman, you know, naturally brings a different dynamic to to a male environment. That's that's a massive asset. But when you're trying to work, especially in some of the shitholes that we've been to, where it's a male dominated environment, you bring a woman in. And it changes that, especially if you've got a woman who's intelligent, she understands the situation, she understands the environment she's in. She can be a massive asset in those things. But actually, what are we asking her to do? We're not asking her to get on the 50 cow. We're not asking her to get on the on the, on the kit, start kicking doors in. Why do we need a woman to do that? But unless she's able to do that and stick up the blokes, then great. But actually, are we trying to do that? No, you, 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 it, it doesn't work. But you think back to Northern Ireland, the girls that we had from, from the deck, they could do things that we could never do, as in the, the regiment was the muscle for the, you know, the end part of the operation. But these girls have, you know, re- like big gold balls uh, to do what they were doing, and, you know, yeah. sometimes by themselves and getting into places where not one person from the regiment could get into. So that, that that's a reason to have them, you know, in the regiment. Then they don't have to have that wing dagger to, to do that. They don't have to have put themselves through selection. They just have to put themselves through a selection uh, to be attached. I don't to think it. it'd be a, pro- uh, you know, to my mates, I don't think it'd be a pride thing that we'd be worried about a woman wearing our cap. It's got nothing. No, we're, no. we're above that. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with that. It's making sure that, you, like you said, you're not lowering the standards to accommodate just because it's a political tick in the box for a Rupert or a, mm-hmm. or a, you know, a minister to say that in their tenure, they've got a woman through the door. Yeah. We really don't care. We just want to make sure that we've got the best of who we're going to get on the ground to do the job in hand. That's it. It's as simple as that. So. Yeah. D- did <clears throat> so you? You obviously spent a significant part of time, a amount of time in the regiment after the infamous incident, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the uh, the E and E and the capture. Um, did that operation? Now you've spoken about it afterwards and how afterwards we really. They were, they were correct, correct things were put in place or were done after action reviews, etc. But in the longer term, did that operation um, bring about any fundamental changes within the unit? Well, uh, we had full projection. I don't even know if that exists anymore within the regiment. We looked at the procedures and everything that went wrong, and and how to you know change that, and then the procedures of. Going up, you know, this is before technology, trackers and everything else. Um, looking at, you know, what procedure can a soldier do in terms of if he's compromised and he's on the run, what does he do? So back at base, they, they can follow that procedure and they'll have a, maybe a rap run where they know exactly where he's at. It's kit. It is basic things like orders, making sure they've got them. Look, that patrol was a complete disaster. There's a lot of bullshit talk spoken about it, and there was nothing right about it. Um, going down to weapons, I can remember um, when we were getting, uh, when we'd been told that we were going to you know, do it, um, we got our, our personal weapons, which were two or threes. And I went to the store and I said, um, I'll take a couple of bandoliers of grenades now. We've got no grenades. Went, well, what's the point of taking a two or three, you know? With the weight, and then I haven't got them. So I went to my mates who were in A squadron, and they were working in half squadron formations, and they were giving me the stuff. Claymore mines had gone missing, and uh, we were told to make them out of um, ice cream cartons. And I can remember Bob Consiglio, probably one of the bravest men I met, and I still believe that guy should have gotten a VC for what he did. Bob Consiglio, he was an ex marine. Um, he sacrificed his life to save four four guys, and um, he knew he was going to die. And he fits the criteria for a VC. Um, I remember watching Bob getting C, you know, sticks of C four, pressing them down in a um, an ice cream carton with a bit of death cord, putting rounds in there, and then taping it up. And you think, you know, it's a waste of time anyway. But you know, this is not right. Um, 
I asked for pistols. I said, do we have any suppressed pistols? And I got laughed at by the, you know, the QM by saying, you know, who the fuck do you think you are, James Bond? You know, like, no, our pistols had gone missing. So we didn't have any pistols. Um, the, the trousers, the um, desert camp trousers came in. Once you'd walked around camp, your arse was hanging out. So we went to the seals who had good, you know, it was good camouflage. The day we were flying in, the RSM came round and he had uh, three things to say. One was he taught one of the lads to get a haircut, and the other, and the rest of us was to get our um, uh, uniforms changed that we weren't Yanks. And the next one was there was a squash match happening in about three months in uh, in, in uh, Hereford. Now, I, I looked like a tramp when I came out. Everything was shredded. Them, them, it was poor quality clothing. They were hanging on. The, these seals that give us all all that gear. None of the guys had beards. All had short hair. In fact, it was the MTO that gave this lad a haircut prior to him flying in. And I think if, the, if your priority or level of care or interest in a patrol is getting a guy to get his fucking haircut and, and wear a British uniform, who gives a shit? You know, them, them Rackies didn't know who, you know, what American uniform was. It's, um, and the kit was bad. Um, Delta were just up the road from us and they had, they had the, um, facility because we had a young Rupert up there as a liaison. They had the, um, facility to get satellite imagery, um, to, um, take on, on our, um, where, where our LUP was going to be. And it, you could get the imagery within 24, uh, I think it was 24 hours and uh, 30 hours if you wanted it, an analysis done on it so you could look. I went, no, OPSEC. Well, I, in them days, the Americans knew what OPSEC meant. We we were in a hangar with like airborne shelters in there and uh, local jundies sweeping it up, going into, you you know, into your place where all your orders are on. Delta were like well switched on. <clears throat> but again, we just got on with it. Splitting on this the conversation. I think this is something which is very unique to an SAS soldier. You, you take what you're given, and we adapt, and we can we will use or carry out the job with what we've got. Um, the day I got back to, back to base after my escape, I was sent straight up to um, Delta because A Squadron Delta were going in to do a bomber assessment on that chemical plant I'd been in. And when I spoke about the different kit, they were horrified what we'd gone in on. They were horrified at the support we had. They were horrified that there wasn't a rescue plan. But I, I, I wasn't. I just thought, you know, that's, that's, that's the crack. You know, that's, that's what happened. Well, that's what happens. But going back to, I think that's why we're quite unique in terms of SF soldiers. We're right. quite generalist. So we just adapt to whatever kind of shit gets thrown at us. Mm. It's a bit of a British, stiff up the lip, kind of bit to that. It's interesting, I was over at Darren, I looked at one of their little sort of museum areas and the kit that's on the guy that they had in like, around uh, the situation in Mogadishu and also during that uh, uh, second golf, the stuff that we were wearing, <laughs> well, not now, but yeah. a few years ago. I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe how little investment we had from the government to put into kit equipment. It's not just us. I mean, we, we, we had it good. You look at the Green Army, the amount of crap that they had, and what they're trying to do with. Mm. You know, it's actually outrageous. I think, but I think, so that, that kit issue, I mean, this, this is well, a current uh, theme. Yeah, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I'll, I'll tell you how thing. ridiculous it got. When, um, when behind the scenes, when A Squadron and D Squadron were prepping, they wanted an excuse or give something to Debellier, and they, that's how these three patrols from B Squadron were formed. And it would be, we would go on the ground, we'd put our OPs in, find the skirts, and then you'd get the, the squadrons across. He came to us and said, right, you're you, you, you putting three eight-man patrols in. These are your vehicles. We've got Land Rover 90s that we had to strip down. They didn't have any um, mountings on them. And I can remember one particular range day when we were practicing, once we got some live ammunition, we had fucking sandbags on the bonnet with the gym peak. And we did an advance. No different shits of Sterling yeah. raiding the New Zealand camp to get some. This is this, fucking decades yeah. later. And we're sitting there and we're driving in and we like advance to contact. Contact comes up and I'm like, like with the old in the, in the passenger seat. 
giving it me. And then as soon as he puts the J turn in, I'm falling out of the, um, the, the, the this Land Rover 90 with a freaking jimpy burning me on the side of my face. And I'm thinking, and this is the SAS. You don't see that in strike back, though, do you? It's all, it's all going down in there. Do you think, so, I mean, this is in stark contrast to what a lot of, probably your experience of being with, uh, with Tutu, um, which all in a long time ago. Do you think that was a situation there? Was, was that because those, I mean, multiple issues. Do you think that's because it was um, one of the... Her- Hereford was still... were finding their feet in how to apply themselves in a conventional war space? Well, I think Is that um, the case? history within the regiment since it was formed in, say, Malaya, when it was reformed in Malaya, they've, they've been very lucky. Every year they've fought in, in theatres where the first time they went there in Malaya, they had the Malayan scouts... The regiment of the, when the SES was formed, they actually started to look at SOPs, how, how they fought the Chinese terrorists. So they were developing it and they made a lot of mistakes. There's still a guy, he's in his nineties. Um, I meet him occasionally and the things that they were doing, like going, you know, walking up in country for three weeks and then having to walk back without, you know, decent radios and stuff like that. So they, they developed it. Then Borneo happened, and the regiment went in and just ripped it up. So then the next thing is, they're going out to the, the Yemen, Middle East. Then they have to learn desert tactics. They learn it. They taught, you know, some of the operations went well, some didn't. The next time they go out to that theater, they just rip it up. Go back to the 80s. The only thing that was going on was Northern Ireland and, say, the SP team. Everything was focused around Black Kit. That's where the, the threat was. All of a sudden, there's a war in the desert. So we're going out there, and in certain cases, I mean, A and D squadron did a superb job, you know, a real good job. But the mistakes that were made, we say B squadron, would never be made when the second Gulf War came on, and the guys were just going out there on, on Gulf War Two and ripping it up and, and finding the feet. And the fact that them campaigns have gone on for so long now, you know. I, I don't know, but I would, I would guarantee, I, I would imagine that they'll go in and just tear it up because it's, it's on their own. So the we learn from the, absolutely, I say we learn from the mistakes. But the issue I would say has been, and I think this is probably something for the British anyway, we're, we're reactive rather than proactive. So because we're reactive, we almost go back in and we're, you know, we're, we're, we're having to start from scratch. But you're lucky enough you've got adaptive people that can actually get amongst it and learn and evolve and sort of work in those environments. I think that is, as you said earlier, that is one of our biggest uh, skill sets, being able to do that. But to be reactive to rather than being proactive is often, is expensive, it's costly in other ways as well. That is one of the issues. I think that's a bit across the board. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, off the lessons off the back of, off those two campaigns, the, the kit equipment we've got now is pretty freaking awesome. The mobility skills and drills that the lads have got um, is is awesome. The 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 stuff that we need to continuously work on, and we always talk about this in any in any conversation, is the absolute basics. So all these big new kind of movement pieces and insertion uh, techniques and everything, they're great. We learn and we adapt. But what we need to stay on top of is obviously your basic skills, and that is as kids. Getting the kids outside, getting the, getting taking my kid out fishing, shooting, walking, all those bits and pieces. So they learn the environments because you can adapt. You, you know, we talk about it's called Brecon can be adapted anywhere. Is it's still the basics, yeah. isn't it? That's that's what needs to be constant. Yeah, the uh, I, going back, we were talking about technology at the start, and I could you mentioned it when um, you, we were on about the girl and the GPS and the, the maps and. And you mentioned it as well. I remember when when GPSs started becoming affordable, oh three oh four, and and the guys and the, the guys started buying them. I remember in my head, I outright refused to buy one. Outright refused to buy one because I thought if I'm going to get one, that's the easy option to get my grid. I took pride in map reading anyway. It's the easy option to get my grid, so I ain't fucking get one. I'm going to stick. I remember going on a going on a slight course. And there was guys on there, and they would hide the GPS away. In the, there was a couple of them. Oh, yeah. Hide and the GPS away. Bags oh, and mate, hide it away. And then they got the ground. What would happen? Batteries run out. Mm-hmm. Mobile phones had just started becoming affordable. Yeah. And we'd 
check to see tech, like just we'd have text journey issues, go into your channel on the, on the hour on an Avex, look at it, and it'd be a text. And the same person every time, mate, where are you? <laughs> Right, they have to ring him up and he go, oh, I'm, I'm trying, night time, trying to explain to you where he is and I'm like, fucking hell, man. Because yeah. he couldn't, he was lost. He had a map, he had a compass, but because he'd become reliant on the fucking GPS, he didn't have a fucking clue to navigate. A paratrooper! Couldn't so, navigate! So I, I helped out on the briefing course and there was a kid on the briefing course who, uh, full screw, infantry full screw, and he said, um, I'd met him on my briefing course. This is him now going on again. One of my many briefing courses. Anyway, he uh, met him again and, um, uh, at that time, we did the swim test. He failed the swim test. I'm not being funny. If you're thinking about joining the special forces, if I ask my kid, one of the things, do you think you need to be able to swim? Yes. I'd say, if you're going to be in special forces, you need to. This guy doesn't know how to fucking swim. The, the next, um, he failed his map reading twice. Corporal in the infantry failed his map reading twice. And I just couldn't believe it. I was like, how have you, how have you failed that? And then, um, and I sped to him, said, look, you know, you, you, you failed your swim test. You failed your map reading. You may be a corporal in the infantry. Why, why is this? All of these are fundamental skills you think you know. Because while I've been working in fitness, I said, mate, you just failed the A-minor. So what the fuck have you been doing for, yeah, yeah. For, for all this period of time? You know? We had a serving blade go down to do junior reckon, and he failed the BFT. Can you imagine? That can help. Jesus. Failed it not once, twice. You get those people out, don't you? Yeah. Even, 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 even in, even bad luck. I he's know, but even in the night before. Even there, but you get was he on the last the night before? <laughs> no, no, he hadn't looked after it. We that. went through a, a period, I don't know what it's like. I mean, we just got like a, a new gym and then we had, you know, weights in there. But there was this culture of um, bodybuilding. It was, and that's when SP team was the main focus. So, you, you know, you, you'd bulk up. He just, he'd, he'd getting himself too heavy. He knew he was doing that course probably about a month or two months prior to it. Yeah. And the first thing he would do is, I'm losing that bulk because I know it's going to be strapped around my waist and uh, I'm going to be running every day. But you said it, the issue when you go on there and, and it, the SES is a great place. I didn't enjoy it, uh, join it myself to be, you know, for, for an ego thing. I did it for me. But one of the things is you do end up standing out on these courses regardless you'll always get looked at people are always judging you so that guy is already on the back foot because everyone is looking at him mm -hmm. because they think that person is going to be mm -hmm. you know we, we had a guy similar he's he came from a non-infantry i think it was a tanky background came on selection was a bit of a wobble so they put him on juniors and then he had an ego on that course he was like well, i don't even need to be on the sas no 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 the sas didn't teach you how to soldier mate the sas just mm -hmm. didn't just tested you and you passed those tests. He has not taught you how to soldier. You're here to learn how to soldier. And his, his arrogance of going down there, the same reason as that lad, meant that he failed. But now, all those people on that course, now I think the guys are coming. Yeah, well, I, I, when I did their, their juniors, I was like, I can't leave this without a distinction. So I'm going down there and I'm fitting in. I'm an infantier. And that's the, the, the thought process. So if they say, put your notebook in that pocket, you put your torch in this pocket, you put that in Play there, the game. you just do it, and then you, you crack on. But I saw guys coming down going, oh, we don't do it that way. And then you're like, yeah, we do. And then it was my mate, um, he, he was X2 para. He got my all my weapons sorted out. I think it was 58 pattern then. You know, with the old roll, the puncher roll at the back, and tighten it up so it wasn't flapping. And then you'd see some of the lads running, and they've got like a jungle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or by the yeah, tits. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, fuck that. Like it is, it's this whole thing of being intelligent enough to understand a very simple situation and fit into it. Because you've got the target on your back, you play that, and it was, it's, it's a bone saying, but you play that grey man all the time. Just do not, you know, stand out. One thing I, I know when I did selection, because I came from 2-3, I knew every fucker was going to be watching me. And I was guilty of, of doing the same thing, because when I was an instructor on, on, on 22 SES, I would go into the training office and then you'd see all the names, different regiments, and I'd see, right, there's one from 2 on, one from 2-3, get them pointed out at me, and I'd be watching them. <laughs> And I was guilty of it, which is, you know, it's fine. The eyes are on them um, from that side. But then there's self-induced pressure for those individuals because yeah. now they're putting the pressure on, which means self-induced pressure means they're going to fuck up. They're going to then overly think about their fuck up. Mm -hmm. When there's other people who just sometimes... Some or they're going to thrive. Or they're going to thrive. Maybe. I mean, there are some lads who can thrive. 
have some people who are, we all know Teflon. Mm -hmm. I've got a few guys that I work with. Shit does not stink to them. Uh, Jay Morn, the lad who's on the TV now, our old mate. Fuck, that man is Teflon. It's because he's so horizontal, nothing fucking sticks to him. Inside, I'm hoping he's screaming. But uh, on the outside, you know, shit. It was, it was just a small example of that. Um, we all got to the cookhouse on day one, and there was a couple of lads from uh, 2 3, as well as myself, and 2 1. And some of them had the SES Epilex with Lance oh, Cobra. Really <laughs> Take it off. <laughs> just like, keep away from them. I had the old uh, crap hat on and yeah, yeah. like that and just disappear in the background. Well, you said that earlier about yeah. when you were up at Depot Paro. You went up Depot Paro as an SAS guy yeah. to, and uh, you play the game. You just you go in, I knew the hair, what the haircut would be, yeah, I knew what no the uniform was in, like everything sort of Because that guy, um, Fred Tolan, he, he was RSM, he's a great guy. Um, I was there with a lad from the Navy and um, we got in and we had the interview told that we were, you know, where we're starting and who our, um, uh, the training uh, sergeants were. And he said, just, uh, crack on, fit in, do everything, and, you know, not play the game, but learn the, inf you know, infantiers. Uh, and, um, he said to, uh, Isla, he said, and you get a haircut. And then he looked at me and went, and make sure he does. Well, we, in Brown and Barracks, there used to be the, the hair barber there. So, your man comes in, he went, I'll just take a bit off the sides and a bit off there. I'm like, you can't do that. I'm not like this. <laughs> Next time the RSM saw us, it was me that got the bollocking. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, that. fuck you, you know. But, uh, uh, I've got a question. Uh, have, we got, have we got enough time? Got a few minutes. Got okay, uh, so, um, obviously when you started out, mate, uh, we didn't have the social media like we do now. Um, there's a few of us now that come out. Well, there are some shit cunts who are XSF. They are. We, 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 we know who they are. They did fuck all time. We kicked them out because they're fucking useless. And now they're big time and any chance to get the berry on. Um, they are absolute bolters. And we know they're bolters because they have, they achieve nothing else. Um, now we're starting to see some really good people come out. Jay Moore is a really good example of this. Um, you know, uh, great character. Uh, and, and I've been on ops with him. I know exactly what he's like. And then obviously uh, yourself from back in the day. There is a massive change and shift, isn't there, with these people coming out? Oh, yeah. It's, it's what we were saying. I think there is an illusion which is created for the NCOs of the regiment. When you leave the regiment, you don't say you were in there. You don't, you don't advertise it. You don't do it. It's like bollocks that. They have every right. When you see officers, ex-officers, they keep their their wings on. They they promote that on their CVs when they're going to an oil company. It's you know I was CEO or I was direct of special forces, and yet the lads are supposed to take, you know keep it down. Now there is a balance. If you start bringing out secrets and shit like that, it's wrong. Great, but I think yeah, why not? The the guys have served their country. They've had a great career. They've reached the pinnacle, and they should be able to utilize that to make a living when they come out. You can't just say, right, um, you're a staff sergeant or you're 001, you're leaving the regiment, um, get yourself an, a job in the office. You know, as a typist, get, you know, go on a building site, be a bus driver. It's like, screw that. You've got to utilize them skills to a certain degree and, 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 and make a living because you're, you know, you're going to be a long time out of the regiment and you've got to make your money somehow. I think some of these people who, who we don't have any credibility for, you know, we, I, I, zero credibility, they came out on social media, they used it quite early on. Um, um, unfortunately, it's put them in a position where, you know, they get legends and can't take them around, you know, we know, we know what they really like. I think it was very difficult for a lot of us because we wouldn't go onto social media because of that integrity and we yeah. had this thing where we shouldn't do this. I think there's a shift in that. That's what's good to see you. Yeah, I mean, I was forced into it because, I mean, there's a there's, there's two, say, Geordie Armstrongs. There's still in my back of my mind, I'm conditioned to, like, in the regiment. The other side, because of the book world, I've got to, you know, like, do that. I would I would never do Twitter or, or FaceTime, and then I was forced into doing this Instagram, which I, I hate because I'm not, like, I think that show the off type thing, yeah, it. and like saying, oh, you know, look at me, I'm doing this. And then sometimes I'm sitting thinking, fuck, I've got to like send a picture, what do I send? You know, um, it's, and it's, you get wrapped up in it, and it, it, it's a vicious circle, and that, that social media ends up 
uh, ruling you. Now, there's a couple of sites on that Instagram. When I've looked through, there's some photographs there that are, are pretty compromising. Yes. And you think you're, you're pushing it there uh, to, to fuck everybody else up. Yeah. Now, never underestimate the, 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 the general public. It doesn't matter who you are. You, you could be the worst SES soldier or the best SES soldier. They're going to be like putting it down. They're going to be on bended knee and, and everything else. I would. I got wrapped up in the early days with about another guy, and it became a competition between the two. It started off with with a thing that he, he crossed the line, and he was bang out of order. Uh, you get wrapped up in it, and you get consumed in it, and what happens is you start losing the the, the picture, focus. yeah, in focus. So forget about them; they'll just they'll disappear or, or go, let them do their thing, and you focus on, on yours. I know it's fucking irritating. It really is. But you just can't get it wrapped up because you're wasting time. It's negativity, and then you're putting yourself under pressure. You focus on yourself and don't look to either. And like you said, you're always going to come out the, you're always going to come out the worst. For, for me personally, on social media, it's about promoting HR yeah. okay, and the stuff that we do around it. It's not about me. It's about using that, using that sad stuff as... The ethos behind what this is all about, mm. and that's the same as your books. You use it, your knowledge, your uh, experiences to promote in those bits and pieces of other books. Uh, obviously, some people they don't have that knowledge, they don't have those experiences, so they're actually trying to promote themselves. But you go online, you have these, uh, you know, these uh, shit thrown competitions with these people. You'll always come out the worst because, as you quite rightly said, instead of focusing on what's important. You never get wrapped up in anybody like saying, "Oh, you know, I like such and such. I don't like you." Do not answer any any shit like that. I got because again, um, what I was I was back at, I was in my house in America, and uh, I was sat there looking through it, and um, it's got a house in America. I got a house underwater. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, so I, I'm looking, and uh, there was a picture, and uh, oh, I was I was firing a, a pistol. Because you can't obviously fire them over here in America. So somebody put this uh, comment on saying, uh, you want to work on your bingo wings. So I put it down, and I'm like that. So I'm sitting having a brew, watching TV. And in the back of my mind, this is going, fucking boiling, boiling, yeah, boiling. Yeah, and I just right. pulled the pin, because this is some computer worry. Fuck, yeah. I just put this at first through, came back, and I was livid. And I thought, right, I've got to get all of that off now yeah, yeah. because you've actually shown yourself. Never ever react to anybody. Yeah, quite right. Because it, no matter who you are, there's always somebody who's going to think you're a, you know, wh- whatever. They, it's, they want a reaction. Yeah. They want attention. attention yeah. And the best thing you is wind someone up. And the mm. best thing you can do. I mean, when I, when I, well, I'm so. very fortunate with this. I don't have, yet, I don't have much negative stuff. I have had it, yeah. but not much. But, if it comes to the likes like Instagram, Twitter, you can block people and that. Yes. I ain't even fucking blocking them because it's attention. Yes. If they get the attention yeah. blocked, I just stick them on mute. And yeah. you don't, you're not even getting that attention. Yeah. Cool. Even the yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I was at a, a book fair and a guy came in, he went, uh, he said, yeah, he said, uh, I passed selection. I went, oh, um, what year? And it was, oh, he said, oh, three years ago. I'm like, really? He went, yeah, he's on TV. <laughs> and I was like, it's a real thing. <laughs> You've got to take a deep breath. And I, and I just said, listen, mate, that is the furthest thing. Selection. You went, oh, no, it's not. He said, uh, um, I got a certificate. I passed the CS selection. And you just go, right, what would you like uh, written in your book? Sign it. And then, I, I, I was sort of Jay. I mean, apparently it's quite cheeky. But I mean, going back to that, there's, there's people there that get, they're doing the fan dance, right? And they're giving out rocks that they get to the fan with a SAS cat badge. That's my cat badge. I earned that cat badge. And the person who's given that rock out, with my cat badge, just hasn't earned that. Yeah, yeah. That is Walter Mitty. But there's all these people who are doing that event for the right reasons. They want to challenge themselves. Fair play, I think it's great. But there's people making money off the back of something they've never done. Uh, you know, and to try and sell that you're doing the selection tool, that's not selection. Tool. No, it's not. It, 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 it isn't. Well, and it's, it, it, but it's, the SES have that aura, you know, where people want to touch it, want to be around it. Them guys have probably never been in the army or maybe have been in, you know, an infantry regiment, but certainly not in the regiment and have done it. So it's, you just got to put it to one side, but it is annoying. And the regiment, again, they, um, I think the disclosure got, um, their patent 
the, the name. They have done on the yeah, cap, actually. Yes, on the cap. Yeah. It's good. And yeah, it's, it, it, it should have been done a lot longer, you know, in the past. Um, but no, I meet at a book signing, a guy will come in and he's got his blazer on, he'll pull it to one side and there's an SES pen under there and you're like, well, I've got one for you. So a mate of mine in is 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 SBS. He said to me, Ben, can you check this bloke out for me? Um, it's my stepdad. He said he was in the regiment for years. He said he was in the regiment for years, and, uh, and I said, okay, what's what squadron was he? He said, oh, uh, uh, I text him. He said he was B squadron. I said, okay, what's the motif? What's the logo of B squadron? So he should know that. He said, oh, um, it says back it said um, it changes all the time. Right, okay. Have you got a picture of your dad because, or your stepdad? Because I can go round and have them. No, by all accounts, his dad's a bit of a shit So I went round to the squadron lines, looked at all the pictures under the name, couldn't see this name. I said, ask him to send you a picture of, of himself in the squadron. He sent me this picture and it was you. He <laughs> sent a picture of you. He said, that's me. Um, yeah, that's me. B squadron. And I, and I was uh, talking to the lad who's next to you in the picture who, uh, who you took about earlier. And I said to him, I said, because obviously he sent a picture, but with the eyes covered out. Yeah. Right? And I, and I knew who the other guy was, and I said, well, who's, who's this guy? And, uh, and he was like, uh, well, that's me next to there, and that's Geordie Armstrong. And I was like, so this guy's been pretending to be you. Yeah. Have all the people in the whole p- picture, and then the one person he's pretending to be is the one person who everyone knows who he is anyway. But you get the, I mean, every, every time I'm out, um, I'll meet people who will claim, and I'm thinking, don't tell me, you know, tell somebody else, you know. And the, from a serious side, there were over a few years, a woman came in and said, um, you work with my husband. And I said, uh, What's his name? Didn't recognize the name. So when did I work with him? She went, oh, in Africa. And I was like, where about in Africa? And she said, it was only last month. I went, listen, Lord, when he talks about me, what does he say? And uh, she went, oh, Chris Ryan. I went, no, my name's Colin Armstrong. And I said, I don't know your husband. And then she went, oh, yeah, things have just, like, clicked. <sighs> Turns out this guy was married and he was going on secret operations. And a similar one happened. Secret black ops. Yeah, secret. <laughs> Where this guy, he was pretending to be a regiment guy. And I just said to them, um, listen, he's got, you'll have a red book and that's got his military career in there. Get him to, you know, show. You'll not remember this book. It was called The Nemesis Files. Now, in a branding, it was black and it had the wing dagger on there. And this bastard knocked me off the number one spot. This is going back 25 years. And the story was about an SAS uh, murder squad. Um, going into Ireland, killing Catholics and burying them in the woods and stuff like that. The truth behind it was it was an editor from, I think, like the Daily Star had come up with this idea. He needed a front man, so you've got an ex-engineer to pose as an SES guy. This book, you couldn't get it. It was just like tsh, 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 flying off the shelves. There was pictures of them pointing to a, a wood corner, going like that, they're in there, and like this. So, fucking idiot went to Northern Ireland on a book tour. He was arrested at the International by the IUC. They took him, they released him within 15 minutes saying this guy is a complete walk in the Now one thing that annoyed me was the regiment never made a statement. When that book was going out, they could have shut it down straight away through the MOD by saying this is total fabrication and everything else. This guy was going on TV on all the well, prime the thing stuff. is, when you can either confirm or deny, so you said, so he could be. And he could <laughs> give it to yeah. 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 But he, this, the, he was asked on TV, he said, so why is there no pictures of you in your uniform? He went, oh, I had a bad divorce. My uh, wife burned all my pictures and uh, everything. <laughs> which, 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 You've got to wrap it up. Oh, sorry. Thank you for hosting the HR4K, Ben. You're Much appreciated. Welcome. Do it again. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Colin. <laughs> You're an author. Original was the one that got away, obviously. The pen name is Chris Ryan. Yep. How can people follow you? Instagram. What is it on there? Um, it's XSAS Chris Ryan. XSAS Chris Ryan. Good website? No. Well, there's a publishing website, but I don't even look at that. Best place is Instagram, then? Yeah. XSAS Chris Ryan. Absolute Thank pleasure. You. Absolute Thank pleasure. You. Let's do this again. Thank you. Sweet. Cheers. Thanks.